Some people claimed it was a miracle. A humpback whale was spotted in Montreal's St. Lawrence River. This young whale had swam almost 500 kilometers upstream in fresh water to visit a city. It was first spotted May 30th, 2020, just several days after the city of Montreal reopened after being hit by a soul-crushing first wave of COVID-19 infections and lockdowns. Humpback whales had never been seen before in Montreal. Many viewed the whale as a sign of hope in the middle of an awful pandemic. But was this really a COVID miracle or was this just a tragedy waiting to unfold? 113 Questions About Evolution with John Perry. Evolutionary question number 32. Can whales survive in freshwater? Montreal's humpback whale and the Amazon River dolphin. Recently, I posted a YouTube short on the Stated Clearly channel about the Amazon River dolphin. This is a genus of freshwater dolphins living in South America, which you're almost guaranteed to meet if you join me on this summer's evolution tour in the Amazon jungle. In that Stated Clearly short, I made the claim that if you were to take a whale or a dolphin from the ocean and just drop it off either in a lake or a river, I claimed that it would die. A lot of people pushed back on that, and for fairly good reason right? Dolphins and whales are not fish. They don't have gills. If they were fish that had to breathe water with their gills, it would make sense that tossing a saltwater species into a river might kill it. You'd expect that gills need to be specially adapted either for saltwater or for freshwater. But again, dolphins and other whales don't have gills. They are mammals. They breathe air with lungs. Shouldn't any saltwater mammal, assuming it can find enough food, be able to survive just fine in freshwater? Sadly, for the people of Montreal, and by the way, I happened to be living in Montreal at that time, the answer is no. Marine whales and marine dolphins, if you put them in freshwater, they actually do just die. Several days after it was first spotted in the St. Lawrence River, it was found floating belly up like a goldfish. This was just like, ugh, it was devastating news. On top of everything else, all the other crap that we were dealing with with, with covid now we had this. We thought it was exciting. Ooh, there's a whale. Now it's dead. The exact cause of death was never completely confirmed. The whale had not starved to death, so researchers first assumed it was hit by a boat, but a closer look revealed a more likely explanation. Ulcerative dermatitis, better known as freshwater skin disease. There are certain types of marine mammals that do just fine in freshwater and in saltwater. Florida's manatees are totally happy either way. But whale and dolphin skin absorbs the water they swim in. Marine whales and dolphins have skin adapted to cope with dense salt water exclusively. If you take a saltwater dolphin and toss it in a river, over the course of several days to weeks, the less dense fresh water gradually invades the dolphin's collagen fibers and skin cells. If the animal can't find salt water again soon, the skin will inflate so much that it bubbles and bursts like a third degree burn. Death by infection soon follows. Scientists understand how this process works especially well for bottlenose dolphins because the U.S. Navy uses them as soldiers. Well, sort of as soldiers. They're mostly used to find things that the Navy lost in the water. Cell phones, car keys, apocalyptic nuclear warheads. Sometimes these soldier dolphins are even sent on freshwater missions. During such missions, Navy scientists have found that noticeable skin lesions start to develop around 12 days of freshwater exposure. This begins with a yellowing of the skin. The general blood chemistry of a dolphin goes way out of whack, sometimes in just 24 hours of freshwater exposure. They really do not handle it well. Early footage of the Montreal humpback seems to show noticeable yellowing of the skin, a sure sign that trouble was brewing. So, if freshwater kills whales and dolphins, how then are there entire species of freshwater dolphins? How does that evolve? Well, the transition from salt to freshwater is a slow evolutionary process. Multiple mutations are needed to fully cope with freshwater. Complex adaptations can't just poof into existence in a single step. This means they needed a transitional environment to accommodate their evolution to freshwater. Behold, the mouth of the Amazon River, a tropical estuary. 
The mouth of a river, an estuary, is a nutrient-rich, and in this case, a species-rich mixing area filled with brackish water. Brackish means part salty, part fresh. Details about the evolution to freshwater for the large Amazon river dolphin, those details are mostly lost to history. When I say large river dolphins, I'm talking about what locals call the boto. Botos are the ones that we see on the evolution tour. They're the ones that live in Ecuador. Young botos are gray. Older botos, especially males, they rub their pigment off as they age, and they end up turning pink in color. There is a saltwater version of the boto dolphin that still lives in the ocean off the coast of southern Brazil. But genetic testing suggests the freshwater and saltwater groups split from each other over 11 million years ago. And just to put that in perspective, the human chimp split was something like six, uh, five to seven million years ago. So this happened a long time ago. The saltwater boto and freshwater boto split. That said, there is a separate type of dolphin, the little bottle-nosed Cetalia, that are undergoing this transition right now. This group of dolphins is currently split into two populations that are almost indistinguishable by anatomy alone, but genetic testing shows they rarely interbreed. Crosses are so rare, in fact, that biologists have decided to call them two different species. One group likes salt water, and the other group likes fresh water. Locals call the salt water version costeros because they're coastal. They live at the mouth of the river and sometimes they're found out at sea. And those that belong to the freshwater population are known as tokushi. The saltwater group can venture pretty far upstream into freshwater when hunting is better there, but it can't stay forever. Researchers have found that it's only partly adapted to freshwater. For example, it lacks a key mutation in its mitochondrial DNA that we know helps convert food into energy in low-salt environments. From the dolphin's perspective, it likely feels sluggish if it stays in freshwater too long. And when it goes back to saltwater, it feels recharged, re-energized. And so they end up just staying in salt water more often. One of the really cool things about estuaries is that salt water is heavier than fresh water, meaning that when the river meets the sea, fresh water actually floats on top of the salt water for a surprisingly long time. Between the two layers is a transition line called the halocline. What this means is that if you're a saltwater dolphin exploring the mouth of a river, near the surface of the water, you get to hunt freshwater fish. You get to learn about their behavior, what they taste like. But then if you need a little bit of salt, all you have to do is dive down. Here's a little bit of footage that I took at a tide pool in Oregon. On the top here, we see fresh water coming in from a river, a little stream, and it's dumping into a tide pool. When I put my hand in, you can see about five inches down there is the saltwater freshwater line. The salt content of the water is so different that it refracts light differently. And you can see as I move my hand through that line, through the halocline, you can see the halocline just with the naked eye. It's really cool. Transition lines exist like this in estuaries. It allows saltwater fish to live underneath the freshwater and freshwater fish to live above the salt water. Dolphins playing in this region get to hunt both types of animals. This really helps in the evolutionary transition from salt water to fresh water. The freshwater population of Cetalia, again, they're locally called Takushi. They have many adaptations for fresh water, including the mutations in its mitochondrial DNA that optimizes it for energy production in low salt. While this group will sometimes visit the estuary, they're not reported to ever explore in the open oceans. It seems like they've lost their tolerance for the level of salt that exists in the ocean. Okay, so that was kind of a lot. Let me just recap this and put it into a, you know, more compact uh, explanation here. The Amazon River is loaded with fish that marine dolphins would love to sink their teeth into, but it hurts a dolphin to stay in freshwater too long. That said, the estuary has the best of both worlds. There are fish to eat from the ocean and from the river. The lower layer of water has plenty of salt whenever the dolphin needs a soothing recharge. Any individual with a mutation that happens to let it stay in fresh water longer than its rivals, well, it gets an evolutionary edge. It can travel further upstream with fewer competitors where it's able to freely catch more food and is likely going to give rise to more offspring. This means natural selection can promote any mutation that even enables just a little bit more freshwater tolerance. As mutations for freshwater accumulate over many generations, they can eventually survive full-time in freshwater. Evidence for evolution in the waters 
of the Amazon River. Before I go, Nancy, the entomologist who runs the evolution tour, she made a little promo video that I think is pretty cool. I want to show that to you here. But before I do that, I just want to point out how fun it is to visit the Amazon jungle with a real entomologist, a scientist who studies bugs. Because she studies bugs, she knows exactly which ones you can pick up safely and which ones you cannot pick up safely. There's a lot of things in the Amazon jungle that are dangerous. Also, she teaches you how to handle the insects so that you don't hurt them. If you're interested, you should definitely sign up for the newsletter on evotour.info because tickets go on sale soon and there are only 15 slots. Without further ado, here is Nancy's epic promo video. John Perry here. In today's video, I just found this pile of crazy stuff that washed up on the beach. Hello, bug friends. My name is Nancy. I am an entomologist. That's my master's degree, haphazardly taped to my wall back there. And I conduct personalized tours of Ecuador focused on insects, ecology, local culture, and conservation. Of all you eat leaves, you're probably picky. I like that there's a stick for reference. <laughs> 